Although Jesus Christ was God, he did not use his divine power indiscriminately. When he, when he did use his power, it was for the benefit of another. All that Christ did, he did for the benefit of someone else. Okay? But, when, but until he began his ministry, he used no miraculous power. John 2.11 indicates that the turning of the water into wine was the beginning of his miracles. John 2.11. Re who, who remember what happened in John 2.11 when he turned the water into, into wine? What happened? Give, 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 give me a brief synopsis up in about as, as briefly as you can. What happened? Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Uh huh. Right. They ran out of wine, so he told them to take. He told them to fill them up, find the uh, fill the pops with water, and then he turned the water. And he told them to fill it, then draw it to the master of the feast. And what the master said? Said this is something different. He said normally you don't. See. He said when do you serve the good wine? He said normally you serve the good wine when Bill. Last. Last. You serve the cheap wine stuff. That way they had drunk well of the cheap wine, then you give them the good wine. But he said, you had given us the good wine first. And see, just for, now what does that say about, say about Christ? He gives us the good wine first, right? He, always, he doesn't give us leftovers or second stuff. He gives us the good stuff right then, right then, right away. Doesn't he not? And see, he gives us of himself first. And then everything else that he gives us is for our good, okay? In spite of the Bible's clear teaching, some people talk that some ancient apocryphal writing suggested that the young child Jesus showed off to his friend by performing miraculous tricks for their benefit. Miraculous treat for their benefit. One such writer had him turning clay pigeons into real birds to frustrate his teachers. Another writer suggested that he once turned a wicked schoolmate, schoolmate into stone to the delight of his friend. Turning a wicked schoolmate into stone. Now, if Christ was going to turn anybody into stone, whom do you think he would have turned into stone? Thank you. Okay. That's why you listen to, listen to, when you think about some of these things, I always say, let your sanctified minds run through and think about who Christ is and what he yes. did. Okay? Such writings are not inspired and are not accurate. The Bible reveals that Jesus exercised patience and self-control in the first 30 years of his life. He willingly subjected himself to the limitations of his human body. Okay? To the limitations of his human body. All this time, did, he, did Christ ever stop being God? He never stopped being God. And think about this. Run this through your mind. Even when he was in the womb, in the womb being formed a baby, growing a baby like the way normal human uh, growth comes, who kept the sun, the moon, and stars in their orbits? So Christ did, didn't I? Remember what it says? Said, all things were formed by him, and by him they what? They consist. So in all the time while he was in the womb, he still held the sun, the moon, and the stars in their orbits and caused the seasons to come and go and caused the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. He caused the rain and the wind all to blow. So you see how, you see how Christ's power is always there? always was, always then, always will be. Subject to the limitation of his human body. Okay. Now, the, now we're on 122C. The humiliation of Christ continued through his earthly ministry. Someone read number one and look at Matthew 4, 1 through 7, and then Matthew 27, 48. Okay. Oh, no, 27 and 48. 1, 4, 1 to 7, then 27 and 48. Matthew 4, 1 through 7. Who's got it? 
Yeah, Matthew 4, 1 through 7. with his written now and all three of Jesus replies to the devil were taken from Deuteronomy now the first one from Deuteronomy 8 3 states that God allowed Israel that God allowed Israel to hunger so that he might feed them with manna and teach them to trust him to provide for them so the verse is directly applicable to Jesus in circumstances and a fitting reply to Satan's temptations. That's what the whole, I'm reading from a different, uh, trans, uh, no, from another uh, writing uh, footnote here. You see, when you look at that, everything that Jesus did when he replied to Satan, what, what was his reply to Satan? All three statements, he told Satan what? It is written. Christ, when he dialogue when he rebuked Satan he told him said it is written and he did not say so and so says but he just used what did he use he used scripture that's the only thing saints that we can use to combat the evil that in the world is scripture and when we know we are tested or tried by by our own evil self by the sin nature in us and the things that come in the world today we have to remember it is written. The only way that we can remember it is written by how doing this? If we use what? Scripture. And how are we going to use, how are we going to know which scripture to use? Thank you, Sister Loretta. We have to know the word. Psalm 119 says what? Thy word what I have that I might not sin against thee. The only way that you are going to know how to combat the evil that comes against you, you have to know the scripture and know how to use the scripture and be able to combat a lot of these things that come up today because you know that they are definitely not right. They had this, what's the same sex marriage. Some I've heard some Christians say, well, to each his own. That's not what God says. It's not what comes natural. I always tell them, said, growing up down the country, we used to watch old dogs run around. We see the male dogs and the female dogs. And we know when the female dogs go in the heat, the male dogs do what? They go sniffing around them, don't they? Now, if you got a male dog that gets confused and goes sniffing another male dog, what do you see? The doggonest dog fight you ever want to see. But then again, old man now, if he goes to Romans chapter 1, not only do they do that, but they approve, They may not do it, but they approve of others who do it. And I'm going to tell you, you know, the, one of the doggone things that you see now, I saw a pastor, he, well, he calls himself a pastor, on TV, and he said he approved of that. Now, there's a, priest, a, a pastor who approves of that, and, it's, and it, the, the, those of his church the parishioners of this church, the members of this church, and they find out that he believes that, they, you know what they ought to do? And you can tell them I said so. They ought to stop one Sunday, and the deacons need to stop saying, whoa, pastor, you can't be pastor if you talk like that. What are we getting to? What are we teaching our children today? What are we teaching our children today? And, uh, you know, and we know what God's word says from the Old Testament. It said man should not lie, lie with man like woman. Huh? It's an abomination. What is an, somebody, what is an abomination? I know we got some school teachers here. What is an abomination? It's something that makes God sick. It's against his word. And see, God created Adam and Eve. 
Who else did he create? That was it. That was it. Adam and Eve, there was no room for anybody else in the, in the mix. No room for anybody else in the mix. Okay. And I say uh, verse 27. Oh, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. I'm out the way. Matthew, Matthew chapter 27. 27. Mm -hmm. You see, on the cross, he thirsted. He thirsted. You might say, well, what made, what made him thirst on the cross? On the cross, he was hot in that hot Judean sun. That day, for three hours, and he had undergone all of God's wrath on that cross. No doubt about it, he was thirsty. Okay, that's say what, and that you did, being in the sun. When you are when we in the sun too long, what do we do? We get what we get thirst. Now see, not only had he uh, been in the sun, but before that he had been before he was on the cross, he had been whipped, and his bodily fluids ran out. Uh, and then he underwent God's judgment for us, so he was dried out. He was parched. And he said, I thirst. Okay? Now, he was tried or tempted continually. Hebrews 4.15. Okay? Hebrews 4.15. Whoever gets it, read it. And tell us which uh, version you have. Okay, go ahead, Sister Willella. Four fifteen. Yeah. Hebrews four fifteen. Okay, go, go, go back and read 14 too. 14 and 15. Now, when you read that, now, when you go to 14, that pass through the heavens. Just as the high priest on the old covenant passed through three areas, he passed through the outer court, then the holy place, and then the holy of holies to make the atoning sacrifice. Jesus passed through three heavens. He passed the atmospheric heaven, then he passed through the stellar heavens, and then God's abode. Now, now, after making this perfect final sacrifice, Jesus did that at once after making the first, the last final, the final perfect sacrifice. Now, once a year on the day of atonement, the high priest of Israel went into the Holy of Holies to make the atonement for the sins of the people. That's in Leviticus chapter 16. Once a year, go like to this. Once a year, the high priest had to go back with continually and continually this year and next year and the year after and the year after to make an atonement for the sins of the people, for the nation's sins. And you see, the high priest couldn't do that until he first made an atonement for his sin. You see why the high, there was always changing of a high priest? Because they were not... Are permitted to continue by the reasons of death. There was a high priest over and over and over. And they had to do, they had to pay a sacrifice for the sins over and over and over every year. Now, okay, for the sins of the people. That tabernacle was but a limited copy of the heavenly reality. 
So when Jesus entered into the heavenly holy of holies, having accomplished redemption, the earthly facsimile was replaced by the reality of heaven itself. Freed from that which is earthly, the Christian faith is characterized in the heavenly. Uh-huh. Your Christian faith is free from the confines of earth. Our faith is solidified in the heavens. Okay, think about that. We do not have to come and make an atonement on any place because our atonement was already made in the, it, it was paid for on Calvary and our salvation is secured in Jesus Christ and your faith your, your redemption is in the heavenly who gonna, who gonna change who gonna unsave you nobody you you are as saved as you are ever gonna be saved saved sanctified set apart solidified in Christ you are in, we are in Christ. Just remember that, saints. It's all an individual. It's a personal, uh, self-secured one. Not self-secured. It's secured in Christ. You had to accept Christ for yourself. You cannot say mama or daddy was a Christian. Well, what about you? What about you? You can't say, well, daddy was a pastor. Well, what about you? You can't say daddy was a deacon. That doesn't matter. What about you? Well, mom and daddy went to church all the time. Yeah, but what about you? What about you? Well, I go to church sometimes, but just going to church. You know, going to church don't make you a Christian no more than sitting in an airplane hanger makes you, an air, makes you a 747. Okay, think about that. You got old folk, what they say, Sister Mary? You got to know him for who? For yourself. For yourself. That's it. Okay. Now, now the word tempted should probably be translated tried. This often is the case throughout Scripture. James 1, 1 to 12, Christ could not be tempted to sin in all the ways that we are. Now, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. That's James 1, 14. When we are tempted, we are drawn away of our own lust. Our own lust. That comes from, we look, why, do, why are we tempted? What, call, what will cause us to be, to be tempted? The old sin nature. That's still there. It's still there. He is not, he is not going anywhere. Now, there's only, only one or two ways that the sin nature is going to be gone. You die and go to glory or else we are rapture. That's the only two ways you're going to get rid of the sin nature. Think about that. Now, when, when and if we die and go to glory, sin nature's gone. Or when Christ comes and raptures us, we're, the sin nature is gone, okay? Now, Christ could not be tempted to sin from within. When you sin from within, that's lust. Lust, okay? His temptation could only come from without. See, Christ had no sin nature in him. Uh-uh. He had no sin nature in him. Why did he have none in there? Because the only way that he could have been a, every sacrifice that was offered had to be a perfect sacrifice. Okay? Now, when they took those lambs and everything that happens to go set, to sacrifice, the, they had to look at it. They couldn't have anything wrong with that lamb. Okay? Unblemished. But Christ is our perfect sacrifice. Perfect. There is no sin in him. The only way that he could have been uh, tried was from without. From within, on the outside, okay? But these, those temptations from without were not victorious in the life of Christ. Christ is our great or uh, empathetic characterized the ability to share in another's feelings, high priest, because he was sinless. You know, that's we... You can't feel like I feel, but we can share in the feelings that I may have when something uh, happens. Let's face it. Young lady at work, her husband was murdered. What happened was her husband got in a fight and whipped the guy. The guy wasn't a man. The guy said he wasn't going to go back and try to whip him again. 
So he shot and killed him. Uh huh. He killed him. What it was? My heart broke for that young lady. It really did. I, every time, if I have a, ever have to go down where I used to work, I asked her, how are you holding up? She said, I'm holding on best I can. I have to tell her that the Lord Jesus Christ can, can do you better than anybody else. And she's, she's a sweetheart. And she's holding on the best she can in all that. Yeah, Mary. Go ahead, dear. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you go to him and say, I can feel what you're going through. But if you have a man who you can't feel, you can, you know, hurt mm -hmm. for what they're going through. But mm -hmm. you can't say, I know what you're really going through. Because mm -hmm. I had to tell this to my cousin two years ago when my husband passed. And I told him, I said, I know what you feel because I've been there. Because you've been there. That's the best but way. I just don't know mm. how you truly are mm. feeling what mm. you're going through, and that's not been through this. Mm. And you can empathy. You can Empathize. hurt for them. You can hurt with them. Right. That's, but you don't know exactly how they feel. Mm. 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 And that's why you should always tell them, said, sooner or later after the funerals and the family's gone away, the family's going to go away, the friends are going to go away, the church is going to it's going to be there for all this but the whole thing is the, the Lord was go, is there with you through it all all the time and they, they need people you know we need to let, let people know that when they're going through a bereavement okay That's it. That's it. And you, you call her, talk to her, she cry with her. That's it. You have to. And you know, we, you know, and we need to stop being so isolated, Christian. Isolated. Isolated. And we need to be open ourselves up one to another. Okay? Because when, see now, it's like I said, if your body hurts, one part of your body is hurting, the rest of the body knows. Mm -hmm. If one part of the church body is hurting, Lord have mercy, the rest of the body ought to be hurting too. Yeah. Not to be standing back and standing off. Uh-uh. We need to be hurt. Yes. It hurts when I see or hear about someone who has lost someone. Yeah. That hurts. That hurts. When my father passed, I hurt for a long time. Man, the brothers here, at that time, that was back in 1979. They stood with me, and they hurt with me. When my friend Milton Worley passed, I hurt, I know his wife hurt, his, his sons, their sons and daughters, and the daughter hurt, and I hurt too, you know why? Because that, he was my man. We used to have Sunday school, remember Mary? And he and I used to, he and I would be here back and forth with one another. <laughs> and we used to, and we would, we would bounce off one another and would say, now if you don't, now don't you see that man? He said, yeah, I see that. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for you to be quiet. Okay? And that's the whole thing there. And we need to be that close to one another where we can cry with one another. We can love one another. Okay? Instead of as soon, soon as we get out, we go, we gone. We're going back to Randallstown. We're going back to downtown. We're going out of town. Okay? And we need to be there for one another. Okay? All right. 
Christ is our great empathy characterized by the ability to share in another's feelings. High priest, because he was sinless. He was our great high priest. And see, he felt, he felt how, he just felt, you know, he just felt their pain. Tell me another time when Christ felt the pain of someone dying. Lazarus. Yes, indeed. Uh, and that, that's the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. And I don't mean that he wept like we hear some of these sniffling tears. I mean, it was an outpouring of the grief that he felt within because of somebody else's grief that they had. That's how we need to be, be with the sins of, with the feelings of someone, how somebody else is hurting, the grief that we feel within. And he was just not those tears. I mean, that was an overflowing of bursting out of tears from within. He wept. He wept, okay? Sin mars an individual's ability to understand another's feeling, okay? Our best empathy will come from a life separated from sin. You know, we need to have our lives separated from sin. That way we can empathize, we can feel how somebody feels. Not in the whole way like Sister Murray said, but we can understand and empathize with them, share in their feelings with them, not involved in sin. Christ can understand our trials. He can understand our trials. Now this one says he cannot understand our, info, in, our inner sinful desire. That is it. Our inner sinful desire. That's lust. Lust. Yes, yes, sister Willella? No, I said he can't understand it because he had none. He had none. He had no sinful desire. His one desire was to do what the Father gave him to do. And our main desire ought to be to do what the Lord Jesus Christ called us to do. That's it. He called us to be a light, a lampstand. You seen these, uh, took these ships one time? One time they, they, they did not have the, uh, the, all this stuff they have now with the, uh, the, with the radar and the echolocation. One time the only thing they had was a, a, a lighthouse. And they would look for that lighthouse. And they would, that lighthouse would, was sure the way how they could make it into the shore. That's it. We need to be a, lamp, a lighthouse. That's it. Those, and when it said, what did it say? Let your what so shine? Let your light so shine. That's it. Let your light shine. You want your light to shine? Be a Christian and let the Christian light in you shine. Yes. I mean, the, let it shine. And don't just let it shine when you want to break and take a smoke and let, it, let the Christian light shine all the time. Okay? All the time. All the cotton picking time. When you're at work, when you're at church, when you're at home, when you're out there in the world, we need to let our light shine. Everywhere. Everywhere. What old song said, This Little Light of Mine? Okay, I'm not, I ain't gonna, I'm not gonna sing this morning. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay, now number three. Somebody read number three for me down on page 122. That's it. That's John 111. Now, what does John 112 say? But as what? But as many who received him, he gave them what, Mary? Power. Power. To become who? The, the sons of God. That's it. Christ gave us, gave us the authority to accept him. See, we will not come to Christ until he draw, un, until God, until we are drawn. We can't come on our own. He draws us. Amen. Think about that. Well, you can't say, well, I came to Christ alone. Did he draw you? You will know that he is drawing you. And how will you know that? Because when he draws, you can't resist. <coughs> you can't resist. Young men, when you were drawn to that young lady, before you got, now I know I'm going back about 30, 40 years on some of us. Okay, and some of the, some of the, some of less. We could not, we could not, 
go to that young lady unless there was something there that just drew us. Men, am I telling the truth? I see her head nodding, but nobody else is saying anything. But she drew us. Her beauty, her, just the way she carried herself, drew us to her. And you young men back there too, sooner or later, somebody, some young lady is going to draw you. Okay? When you wake up. Okay? Some young lady is going to draw you. Okay? You are going to be drawn. Christ draws us. He draws us to him. <laughs> he draws us to him. And whether or not we respond is on you. But then again, you know what? He knows who's going to, who's going to answer. So might as well give up fighting and just go ahead. Okay? Now, number four, he was often without suitable housing. Okay. Someone wanted to read that for me? That's Matthew 8, 20. He had, he had no, like we have a house we can go to. There's a, there's a kitchen, a dining room, a bathroom, a bedroom for us. But Christ did not have those amenities while he was on earth. Where did he, where did he stay while he was on earth? It seemed that he stayed with different individuals. We see, we can look at it in Luke 10, 38 to 42. He possibly stayed with different disciples. And now 1 Corinthians 9, 5 seems, that, seems to indicate that most of the, of the apostles were married and had families. And you see right there? The apostles were married and had families. When we look through it all, uh, the apostle Paul let it be known that all the apostles, they had the right to marry and have families. Preachers have a right to marry and have families. There is nowhere anybody is told that a preacher or a leader or an elder has to be separate and no wife. That's right, I'm, st I'm stomping. I'm stepping on the Roman Catholicism. Oh, now, they don't want no, they want, you know, the, here's, the, here's the Pope, here's the Pope and the priest and the nuns, y'all can't be married. But we have found out they had some deadly things going on there. Huh? all over the place okay there's no if you now if you decide not to be married that's between you and the Lord it's between you and the Lord now you have to come up here and stand and say well the Lord has told me not to get married that's between you and the Lord okay that's between you and the Lord sometimes saints we need to keep out what's between us and the Lord between us and the Lord Okay, don't tell nobody. That's between you and the Lord. <coughs> the next paper is in the First Corinthians nine five. And it says, "Have we not the power, the right to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as the other apostles, and as of the brethren of the Lord and Cephas?" Now that's the apostle Paul was talking. It said number five, he was blasphemed. Uh, Luke eleven fifteen. Someone want to read that for me? The chief of the devils. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, see, the whole thing is, eh, if the Lord could cast, since the Lord could cast out devils, who does he need permission by from? Think about it. You come to my house, and I keep you out because you don't have to act. I don't have to ask anybody, can I kick you out? You're going, you going out of there one way or another. All the, all, either on your own uh, feet or in handcuffs, one way or another, okay? They talk bad about Christ. Also in 6, he was made lower than the angels. Hebrews 2, 6 to 8. We write here at Hebrews 2, 6 to 8. Someone want to read that for me and tell me which version you have? I know you got a King James. Mm -hmm. For in that he put all in subjection. 
gonna go here tonight. That is true. He was made a little lower than the angels. In other words, he was made a little lower in his, uh, when, he let, when he came from heaven and came to earth. He was made lower. Than, so the angels had always stayed in heaven. They had access to God's throne continually. But Christ voluntarily left heaven and was made lower. He did not hear he left the, the, where he used to dwell in glory and came to the earth. Why? For the suffer our, our redemption to be done. He was made a little lower. And see, you know, that's the one good thing. I'm so glad. And what it what all it all comes down to, saints, all of that was done before the foundation of the world. See, God had a plan. A lot of times we make plans and we don't know how they're gonna come out. But before all this was put in order and all this started to come to being. Before God said, let there be light, everything was in order. That blows your mind, doesn't it? Before God said, let there be night, let there be light, he saw you exactly where you're going to be sitting right now. Now, see, that's, some, that's, what's called, that's what's called God's sovereignty. In other words, he made everything for himself and everything is taking place according to his own order and you know the thing is God ordered God ordained, God ordained it and guess what he doesn't have to explain it to anybody now if why God did it I don't know don't ask me why he did it because he doesn't have to explain anything to me <coughs> remember what he told Job Said, where were you what when I when I formed the foundation of the earth? And he, and he told Job, said, answer me if you can. Who is this that questions, that offers up, that gives up, that puts up questions without knowledge? Job didn't know what he was asking. And if you're gonna ask God, why did you do this? You ask him questions without knowledge. Why did God do anything? Because it pleased him. And you know what? He just wanted to share who he is and what he does with us. Now, that's enough question right there. We need to, sometimes, you know, saying the secret things belong to God. Amen. We need to stop d trying to dabble around in God's business. Just like now we're going to send things up to Mars, see if there was water on Mars. See if Mars, see if there's, uh, if there's a, if there's a habitation up there. Look, we have enough trouble down here on Earth. Why we want to go up there? All that money, all that money that's going there. Look at how much junk we got floating around in outer space. <laughs> and think about how, how it could be used here. You see the foolishness of man? Uh -huh. Okay, all that stuff there that's floating around up in the universe. We could... Uh, and our scientists and our thinkologists, they could refocus their attention off the heavenlies. God's given us enough to do right here on earth. Okay, has enough to take care of, to find out the, if they will submit themselves to the Lord. Enough stuff, enough knowledge to help us find some, of the, the, some medication for the illnesses that we have. Some take care of MS, high blood pressure, Crohn's disease, all these other things that go around. Y'all see how much money they spent on Mars? Throw me a couple hundred thousand of that and I'll, I'll, I'll know what to do. Okay. Now, the humiliation of Christ intensified during the week of his crucifixion. The intensity of his humiliation. It was his humiliation. You know, you say, when did Christ's humiliation start? It started when he left heaven and was born here. That's when his humiliation started. 
He had to go through all that. Had to go through being born in a virgin's womb, to being born in a stable, to being, uh, had to go through all the, the normal things where it's written in the law for the Jewish baby boys to do. Had to go through being obedient to a man and a woman. Had to go through all that. Had to go up every year up to the temple for the sacrifice. Then he had to go through the humiliation of arguing with Satan. He had to go through the humiliation of uh, all those things. All of that. He had to go through all. That was humiliation. Here's the one who spoke everything into existence. And he had to make himself humble. And come down and pay a, pay a penalty for the redemption of the human, human beings who turned their backs on him. And cursed him. And beat him. Okay. Now, Luke 3, 23 says he lived only to be, he lived to be only 33 years of age. Now, those of us who had a book there has suggested timeline of Christ's ministry. All of that, you see how this is from ages 30, Luke 3, 23, then age 31 covers John 21, 13 to 5, 4, 54, age 32, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Then age 33, it was Mark, Luke, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John covers them all. And then age 33 plus, that was covered. The, all of that was the Passover. You see, when you're getting ready to have the Passover, you had to prepare the lamb for the Passover. You had to set the lamb on the side and make sure that it's the right kind of lamb. All of that goes on. All that went on. When you go back and see what happened in when the, when the Israelites were getting ready to leave Egypt, they had to have that Passover. Okay? And what they said? What did they tell them? What did Moses tell them? Say, when the when God's, when the destroying, when the angel of death sees the blood on the lentils and the cypher, what's that angel gonna do? He's gonna do, he's gonna pass over. So the death is going to, God's death, God's destroying angel is going to pass over you. When the Lord, when God, when the Lord looks at us now, he, his judgment has, has, has done what to us, saints? Passed over. Passed over. Okay. Now, number two, he rode on a borrowed donkey. Someone read that. That's in Zechariah 9.9. Now see, that's Zechariah 9.9. 9. That was prophesied back before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. See, God wrote it in the Old Testament, and it come to fruition in the New Testament. I remember one, Bible, one Sunday school teacher I had, he said the Old Testament is, new te is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Okay? Now, now the next one, Matthew 21.6-7. Who's okay? The 21, 6 to 7. Now, what it is, when you set somebody on a coat or a donkey, you know what that was? That was, that symbolized a peace offering. See, Jesus Christ is our peace offering. Our peace offering between who? Between us and God. Now then the next time he's come, he's going to come how? On a white stallion. And a white stallion was only written when? When we read about it then and in the, in the Old Testament, not Old Testament, uh, old world history, the only way the one who rode a white stallion was a what? A conquering king. So he, next time, first time he rode on a donkey who was a peace offering, the next one, next time he comes, he's going to be riding on a white chat stallion. You ever see these uh, horses that the police ride down downtown? They are not stallions. They are geldings. 
Because you know what? You tell a stallion you downtown, he's something else. Okay? You t and when you watch the horse race like over here, those are not geldings or mares. They sometimes they ride mares, but they are stallions. I, used to, I watched some of these old, these old, uh, old time uh, movies, and when the hard day, oh, I, I watched that one that dealt with the uh, samurai. They rode stallions. Now, they were made for war horses. Back in World War I, one time, uh, pre World War I, up to, up to they came up with tanks, they had horses, they called them horse soldiers. They were horse cavalry. And those men rode, rode stallions. Re heard about the Buffalo soldiers? Yeah, black soldiers. They rode horse, they rode stallions. And you know what? They came to war. They were stallions. Now you see a stallion, he comes to war. And see, when Christ comes on that stallion, he comes to wage what? War. On who? The, the, un the unjust. Okay? Now, he bought an upper room during the Passover. Uh, who's got that one? Luke 22, 11 to 12. Okay, now that was an up, he bought, it, he borrowed the room. They did not own, own the room anywhere for them to have the Passover. They bought an upper room. And you know, he knew exactly where he was. He said, go tell him, said, and he was showing up a room. See, Christ knew it was already ready. And he, this, his disciples didn't make any, they did not make any, uh, they did not back up against him and say, how you know that's there? Only thing they knew was, well, the good master said, the master said it was there, but so we're going to go ahead and do it. Now, the disciples followed Christ. Why can't we follow what his word says right now? Why can't, saints, why can't sometimes some people who call themselves Christians, pastors, priests, popes, potentates, they talk about well, this is what we say. What does the word say? What does the word say? It is written that this is what shall happen. And I get the, sometimes when I'm somewhere, particularly down, my, down the Lexington market, I get, in the, I get in some heated conversation. And my, 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 my three words are, it is written. Well, ain't nobody, I said, open your book, it is written. Your witness say, but you know, you can't. I say, no, but it's written. Well, my books, I say, your books are, is, a, is, a, is a bastardized one. I said, I said, the one we use, it is written. He said, well, you can't. I said, the book says, if you do not believe that Christ is who he is, you're going to die in your sins. He said, you can't. I said, but it's written. That's what it says. I said, throw that thing away and get a real Bible. <coughs> And say some, I always say, the, the, the song says, onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. Sometimes we need to be a, an at-war Christian. We, you are, we, are, we, we, we fight the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, they come up with this, all this junk. Masons, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, we at war with you. Yes, we are. We're going to tell you. We're going to tell you what the book says, and then we're going to tell you what your outcome will be. Okay? That's the one. Pastor Brown, we always, we owe him, we owe him, a, we owe him a witness, and then a warning. Don't argue with him. Give him your witness. Then give him the warning. We are not called here to dialogue with the devil. Uh-uh. Never die. Why am I going to dialogue with the devil? I'm just going to say, it's written. My wife's uncle, bless his soul, he was a 33rd degree mason. He wouldn't listen. I just said it's written. 
Boy, I can take that Bible and beat you to death with it. I said, you what you going to do? Hit me over, over the head? I said, but it's written on. It's still written. I said, I know what you may take out of there, but it's written. Well, then after that, he just he didn't say no more. Never got, and I said, it's still written on. Sometimes he says some very unkind things to me, but guess what? It's still written. <laughs> now, number four, he was betrayed for a slave's price. Someone read that for me. That was the price of a slave. 30 shekels of silver. In other words, the man servant or the maid servant, that's a, that's a, that was a servant. And if the ox either killed him or pushed him, that was the price of, of the slave. Okay. Now I turn over. 124. Someone read that there. Thirty pieces of silver, a slave's price, a slave's price. Thirty pieces of silver, and look at that. Judas Iscariot. Here's a man who who had a, who had a part in the ministry, and he was the he 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 kept the money bag. See, so be careful, because everyone who bears the money bag is not right. Okay, and Judas Judas was a thief. Okay. Okay, and then he covenanted with them with the chief priest. The chief priest. Now here's the ones who had should have been looking for Christ and knowing he who he was. They wanted to kill him. Just because you love the Lord. Just because you know the Lord. And just because you give out the word. Everybody's not going to like it. And some people sometimes may be after you. May, they may want to kill you. Like they, like they want to kill Christ. But guess what? So what? They want to kill you? Absent from the body? Present with the Lord. Okay. Yeah, Mary. But you know it's a lie. Jesus is scary sitting right there with the Lord. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then he said, everything he did, and he said, there, with that face on, I'm asking, he betrayed. Mm-hmm. Then he would. True. But they right there in the midst, knowing all what the word of God is saying from the pulpit right in the body. Mm -hmm. But they put on, they got a mask on. That's it. And all this. When I see the mask, they think it up. But he mm -hmm. sees it. He knows. He's hidden. He's not. And like I would tell old preacher Brown a long, long time, I said, Pastor, everything in Pimlico is not saved. I said, better be careful who you open the door up. And I'll say the thing. Everybody who sits underneath your voice, and you can be, you have preached the gospel. From A to B and A to Z. And guess what? They ain't listening to you. Even right now, there may be someone here that's got on a mask. That's got on a mask and is not saved. They just play act because it looks good. It because it looks good. Because it looks good. Uh, and you know what? You can be a, you know what a hypocrite is? Somebody who's play acting. It came from, they used to do the things in the Roman theater. That's back in the, uh, what, back in that, uh, the, the Colosseum. They would put on play acting. Pretending to be. Pretending to be. You can pretend to be all you want, but God knows. The Lord knows. Uh, uh, and sooner or later, you can play act all you want, but sooner or later, that which is done in darkness will soon be brought to light, and God will, the Lord God will take off your cover off you, and you'll be there naked. And all your play acting days are over. And guess what? And who gets the glory? 
the Lord gets the glory because you cannot play act with God and get away with it. You can't do it. You cannot be some, try to be something that you aren't because God will, will, he will, he will let it be known. He will let it be known. And guess what? It might be now, but one day, go back and read Philippians chapter 2 again, okay? God will make it known. People say, what, what's that guy named Septon in the table? He's there talking and saying, I want to see, he said he's around trying, waiting to get in here. He's trying to get some to put in the good word for him. If your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, Cedric, you ain't going nowhere but to hell. And it's written like that. It's written like that. Somebody had a, case, had a problem with Steve Harvey about some the way he, do, that he does his acting. But you know, the, the, the way he puts on his show, his uh, program. But you know what? I have heard Steve Harvey on national TV. He said, he said, I tell you what. He said, if it wasn't for Jesus Christ being my personal savior, he said, I've been dead and in hell a long time ago. Now, you may not like the way he carries on, but I, he's a comedian. That's the way he makes his money. But he knows who, who, who he, he knows his savior. That's it. He knows his He said there's one thing that he would like to introduce Jesus to everybody. He said, I want to introduce you all to the one who spoke the worlds into existence. The one who came down and died on Calvary's cross. He said, I want you to meet my Savior. Now, I heard Steve Harvey say that. Now, if he said that, he said it before a nationwide audience. Now, he owns the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? By that testimony, Jesus Christ owns him. That's it. You see what? Every time we start getting good, we got to stop. Page 124, number five. That's where we're going to, by God's grace, we're going to stop there till next week.